So I want to talk about what I've learned from Shakespeare. Like a lot of people, I first encountered Shakespeare in high school. I can still remember reading King Lear with my 12th grade class. It seemed like we were reading that play forever, like definitely months, but forever. And we talked about it and we acted it out as a class. And at times it just felt like that play cracked open the universe. I remember I saved up my paper route money. I was a 17 year old paper boy and I just, anyway, I saved up my money to buy this complete works of William Shakespeare from the bookstore. And it was, it was enormous. It was like the size of a suitcase, huge. I was maybe not a normal high school kid, but I would read, yeah, I remember reading these plays on like a Saturday afternoon. I'd read As You Like It or Anthony and Cleopatra. I had fr I had friends. My name is Dr. Moore. I teach great books at St. Thomas University, and Shakespeare is my teacher. So I'm going to talk about the three things I've learned from Shakespeare. First lesson, the self is a group project. So the self, I think Shakespeare suggests, is is like a text, almost like a story that has been authored collaboratively. Other people have a say in who you are and this makes us vulnerable in a real way you are defined by other people your your reputation what other people say about you has a real effect on your life it can can open or close doors for you and and other people through through recommendations or through uh, rumors or slander they can alter how you are perceived, and then how you are able to move through the world. They can potentially even destroy you. And Shakespeare's women, I think, are particularly vulnerable to this. He seems to to think in the, in the case of women, this problem is, is especially acute. In a play like Much Ado About Nothing, Hero, who's a, a kind, good, person. She's about to marry this guy, Claudio, who's a bit of a dip, honestly. Hero has her reputation destroyed through this wicked scheme. This guy, Don John, persuades others that she's sleeping with other men. She's sleeping around before she gets married. And Claudio, you know, stupidly buys this and he impetuously decides not to marry her. And there's this, this risk that her whole, whole life could be destroyed. Othello has this same dynamic. Iago spends the entire play slandering, destroying Desdemona's good reputation, changing the way her husband Othello thinks about her until... Othello is swept up in a murderous rage. He kills, he murders his own wife over a rumor. So Shakespeare was, was very interested, I think, in, in this kind of thing, maybe especially in the case of women, but I think it, it applies to everyone that we are all vulnerable to this, this kind of slander. And the deeper, somewhat unsettling truth is that your identity, who you are, is to some extent in the public domain. And you are a different person to different people. Like to your parents, you're a child. And to your coworkers, you're a colleague. And you're all these different things in all these different contexts. And how people view you dictates how you are able to function and operate in the world. So your identity is like a narrative or a story that's co-authored by everyone you know. And that's kind of an unsettling thought. But there's also this, this beautiful dimension to this, I think, which is that self-knowledge might only be possible through relationships. So if, if the self is this kind of collective product, then in a way we can't understand ourselves by ourselves. We need the help of other people. And so attaining self-knowledge might not be possible without the help of others. There's the scene early in Julius Caesar where Cassius talks to Brutus and says that he will be like a mirror to him. And since you know you cannot see yourself so well as by reflection, I, your glass, will modestly discover to yourself that of yourself which you yet know not of. And so Cassius suggests, you know, I could be like your mirror so that you could see yourself properly. And Cassius might not be the best example. Like, he might be an untrustworthy mirror, but there are other images like this. So it might be that you can only really know yourself through the eyes of your friends. Lesson two. Nature is both flexible and inflexible. So one of the great things Shakespeare gives us as a thinker, I think, is, is a clear understanding of nature. And part of what he demonstrates is that things we might associate with the natural order or natural law may not be as fixed or as permanent or as immovable 
as they seem. But it's also the case that things aren't infinitely flexible. Anything can't just be anything. How do I say this? This is actually, I wrote about this in my book and I think I put it pretty clearly there. As Shakespeare repeatedly illustrates, many distinctions and categories that seem natural or absolute are actually conventional and power structures that seem permanent are actually malleable. Still, a human being for Shakespeare is a particular biological or maybe ontological kind of thing, a particular being distinguishable from a dog or a ghost. As a being limited by certain non-negotiable natural imperatives like death, for instance, humans are not infinitely changeable. So in Shakespeare, like one area where this applies quite clearly is gender roles, right? He, a lot of his plays feature cross-dressing and what Shakespeare seems to be on about in those those plays is is kind of troubling the traditional understanding of, of women's work and men's work or women's roles and men's roles and maybe even troubling those binary categories right and a character like Viola for example Portia in A Merchant of Venice is another excellent example right at the end of that play there's a there's a trial scene and Portia disguises herself as a lawyer and she outwits and outsmarts all of the the men in the play uh, and she never would have been able to do it in her women's clothes. But simply by putting on men's clothes, she's able to outsmart and outdo all the men. So Shakespeare challenges a number of things, lots of things that, that would have been held to be natural in his day, like the patriarchal order. I think he suggests frequently, really, that, that maybe that's actually a conventional or customary order and not rooted in nature. However, he seems to stop short of saying... There's no such thing as nature. There's no such thing as the natural. A human being is a kind of thing. It's, it's different from a dog or a ghost. And one of the ways I think he illustrates that there are limits, that there are definite boundaries, is that you know, often outcomes are predictable, right? Particular character types, particular actions result in particular endings or particular consequences. So there's there's a certain you know, normative or natural theory of causation at work in his plays most of the time. So I think Shakespeare really challenges us to think about what things in human life are natural and what things are conventional. And it's not always easy to, to figure that out, what things are flexible and what things are fixed and immovable. Okay, the third thing, politics is theater. All the world's a stage, but this is particularly true in politics. In plays like Henry V and Julius Caesar and Coriolanus, Shakespeare regularly demonstrates to us that, that political power is largely rooted in performance, the leader's, the, the ruler's ability to perform. Many of Shakespeare's greatest speeches are explicitly political. I mean, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. What's better than that? And there's Anthony's funeral eulogy, honorable men, there's Coriolanus, there's Richard II. So success in politics, Shakespeare teaches us, requires mastery of rhetoric, an ability to command the audience, to capture people's imaginations. And he clearly understood this as someone who worked in the theater. You know, a lot of making things happen politically requires support, right? A critical mass of supporters. Now, this can all be used to bad ends. Harry, Henry V, is probably guilty of war crimes. And Anthony's funeral eulogy, you know, sends a, an angry mob out to murder innocent poets. So while Shakespeare, I think, has a normative sense of justice, right? Like certain actions produce certain consequences. I don't think he's entirely convinced or, or certain that, you know, good will always triumph over evil or the right people will ascend to power. I think we need to be especially vigilant with great political performers. So please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this. I make videos about philosophy and literature, great books. You can find some more of those over here. Thanks very much. Talk to you soon.